railroads are all about pushing boundaries to connect towns with cities. Throughout the 19th century, no mountain was high enough and no valley was low enough to stop them. Quite a few railroads existed in places that doubters would least expect. Mount Washington, Pikes Peak, the Canadian Rockies, and California's Carrizo Gorge. Of all of the routes that were at one point or another deemed as impossible, one such railroad dared to go where, for once, it did seem impossible. Across the ocean. The Florida East Coast Railway got its start in the 1880s, when a standard oil founder named Henry Flagler acquired a narrow-gauge route running south from Jacksonville, Florida. Within 20 years, this route would be standard-gauged and extended south to reach all the way down the peninsula to the town of Palm Beach, at the time home to a small group of settlers. Along the way, the railroad led some real estate revitalization projects that turned swamplands into hospitable destinations. These included St. Augustine, Ormond Beach, Daytona Beach, and Palm Beach, where the railroad also put resort hotels that the trains would bring people to. Even the standards of living were elevated, especially when the tracks reached a village of 500 inhabitants named Miami. As service got underway, Flagler would build the town's first station, set up the water and power systems, built up the streets, with one of them being the site of the Royal Palm Hotel, and financed the town's first newspaper, the Metropolis. So much was built up here because of the railroad, and Flagler personally, the city officials openly contemplated changing its name to Flagler in Henry's honor. He would persuade them to keep the original Native American name. Even then, Flagler had one more destination in mind for the FEC. In the early 1900s, a canal was being dug across the Isthmus of Panama, which would allow for new trade capabilities. Stretching for the southernmost tip of the peninsula is a chain of islands that extends southwesterly for over a hundred miles. Situated at the end of these islands is Key West, the southernmost town in the U.S. that was only accessible by boat. Key West was the U.S.'s closest deep-water port to the canal, and Flagler believed that the town could flourish as part of an impending trade route between the U.S., Cuba, and Latin America. If these islands could be connected to the mainland, it would become a new international outlet for passengers and freight from inland destinations bound for parts unknown. It took numerous surveys to determine this route's feasibility, but work would begin in April of 1905. Within months, two crews began building from both ends of the line towards each other, employing over 4,000 men. Across its 156-mile-long run, a total of 32 bridges would be constructed. The longest of these bridges was over six and a half miles long between Marathon and Little Duck Key. Construction would be held up by three hurricanes over the span of three years, draining the railroad's budget. The storm of 1906 would claim the lives of 135 workers. Through it all, Flagler was still pouring in every possible resource on getting this route finished. Critics were calling this route Flagler's Folly, as the total cost of the project would get up to $49 million. Against all odds, though, the first train arrived at Key West on February 12, 1912, carrying Mr. Flagler in his office car. With Flagler's passing just a year later, at the age of 83, he had completed everything he had set out to do for his railroad. The Oversea Railway, as it came to be known, would be hailed by many as the eighth wonder of the world. Indeed, given how much was spent on its construction, the railroad was determined to get their money's worth out of this route. Like it had done on the peninsula, the route established tourist destinations wherever they could. At Long Key, the railroad's housing development for track layers and bridge builders would be converted into a fishing camp, where some of the best fishing in the world was had, according to the brochure. More would be established along the islands, but Long Key was the most prominent one. 
Typically, four trains per day roam the bridges, two in each direction. The premier name train was the Havana Special, which brought passengers from Miami and offered connecting ferry service to reach Cuba. Next on the timetable was the Oversea, which stopped at every local station along the route and sported a parlor observation car during the winter months. This was especially popular with tourists traveling between the various fishing camps on different islands. But even in those days, freight was what paid dividends, and the whole point of the extension was to cater to an expected boom that would begin with the opening of the Panama Canal. In its early years, there was an influx of Cuban produce being ferried across the bridges, which was so lucrative in fact that it ended up putting the state's commercial pineapple growing out of business. As the years went by, it was becoming clear that the boom that Flagler had envisioned wasn't materializing. The best the route could do was the occasional unit train of potable water from the mainland, with small movements of coal, fruit, and building materials. With so little freight being moved, Key West wouldn't become a major refueling stop for ships. Back on the peninsula, the rest of the system was flourishing with a statewide land boom that was ushering in a golden age for passenger service on the line. Even so, it also made a living in freight by carrying Florida's produce northward from the peninsula. A hurricane in 1926 would put a quick end to this boom, followed by the stock market crash just three years later. In the Great Depression, the railroad declared bankruptcy in September of 1931 with the city of Key West going broke four years later. Of all the routes the FBC operated, the Key West extension was by far their biggest money loser. Then, on Labor Day in 1935, the wind kicked up. Category 5 hurricane, still to this day the most intense to ever make landfall in the U.S., swept over the Florida Keys. Notified on short notice, the FEC sent an evacuation train down the route to rescue a group of workers, mostly World War I veterans, at their camp near Matacumbe. Progress was slowed by ocean waves breaking over the tracks and by getting snagged on a steel cable that took 80 minutes to untangle. When the train stopped at Isla Morada at 8.15 that night, winds of 200 miles per hour prompted a storm surge to sweep over the entire island. Within moments, all nine passenger cars were swept off the tracks, with only the locomotive staying upright. They were just a few miles short from their destination, where over half of the 400 or so veterans perished in the storm. In all, at least 408 people in general were killed, roughly half of the people living on the Keys. The optics were no less sobering for the FEC. With over 40 miles of track washed away, and many of the fishing camps, including Long Key, also wiped away, the extension was left in ruins. Repair costs were astronomical for a route that had long been a money drain for the company. It was widely accepted that the railroad would have eventually abandoned service to Key West anyway, but the unfortunate timing with the hurricane made the inevitable happen a lot sooner. After the doomed rescue train's equipment was salvaged, the railroad would sell the entire right-of-way to the federal government for $640,000. With its remaining rails ripped up, the right-of-way would become the basis for the southernmost segment of US-1 a highway that mostly follows the old roadbed all the way to Key West to this day. Many of the bridges would be reused with their decks covered over and remained in use for at least 50 more years before switching to their own spans. Although Key West is a hot travel destination today, the amount of commerce happening here, even with a naval base, still wouldn't justify having a railroad even now. Was this railroad impossible to build? As it turned out, no. Could it support itself with the high expectations stacked against reality? As it turned out, also no. The Key West extension was called Flagler's Folly before it was built, 
after it was built and after it was destroyed. It's too easy to write the whole venture off as a failure, but it's an achievement that this line was built at all and formed the basis for today's highway access across the Keys. This engineering feat could only have existed in the time that it was built, just after travel by water was deemed too slow, but just before automobiles would sweep the nation off its feet. The line's remnants stand today not necessarily as an eyesore from the past, but as a public curiosity that came from a time when it seemed like anything was possible. <laughs>